Call the meeting to order. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good afternoon. We did not have anyone sign up for to address the board, so I'll move on to approval of the minutes of the September 1st meeting. Do I have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. I have a motion second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Those are approved. On to approval of the, the agenda. Do I have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. I have a motion and second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. The agenda is approved. On to conflicts of interest. There were no new ones presented. So I'll move on to approval of consent agenda items 7A through D. Do I have a motion to approve? So moved. Move. Second. I have a motion and second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Those are approved. On to reports to the president. First, we would have the Academic Resource Center update from Julie Westerman. Megan's, <laughs> they had her name on it, so I just assumed, so. <laughs> President Nicholson, members of the board, um, my pleasure to introduce Julie Westerman, Associate Vice President of Academic Resource Center. Thank you for the one of our student success advisors in the Student Success Center, and we've kind of um, made some changes to our tutoring center this year, and it's called Academic Resource Center, and Julie is the coordinator of that, so that's what her update is about today. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. So last spring, uh, it became a priority at Southeast Tech to work on the tutoring. We had tutoring, and it was mostly all peer tutors. We had somebody who very diligently put together a schedule, but it really kind of revolved around when those tutors were available, and there wasn't a lot of training to those tutors. So as we started to think about, like, if tutoring becomes this priority, what do we do? How do we improve it? And so these were our key goals. We wanted to increase the hours. We wanted to increase the quality of tutoring. And then tutoring is always a retention measure. And so wanted to think about um, where and how are we gonna strategically start to think about how to improve retention and student success. So those were our challenges or our goals for these, this year. And I, this is my only other slide, so I have a list of things, and then if you have any questions, I'm, I'm happy to answer them. Um, what I started with was a report. I got a report of the, of the last two years, so four semesters, what were the most dropped and failed courses, and I combined that with the courses that had the highest enrollments. And so it's no surprise, they tended to be gen eds and prerequisites. And so for each of those 12 target classes, we're thinking very specifically to have a specific um, measure put into place to th think about how do we increase, and math is big, accounting, the introduction to accounting is big. Um, for healthcare, it's the anatomy, physiology, and then the medical language, English, intro to computer. So those were our basic ones. Um, one of the exciting things that's happened is we, we moved locations. We're in a different building. It's much more accessible for students. Um, it's, a, it's a great space. It's a large space. It has side rooms so we can work in small groups and we're going to um, work to increase our online tutoring so we're going to start doing that more and so with and in the it was we call it the arc the academic resource center and in that in the arc this year it really the focus is those gen eds and those prerequisites and then just starting to reach out and where i hear a need um, what we try to do is agency tutoring. And so if there's a program that really needs something, then we go to them and we figure out, okay, who's the tutor? Where can we take them? Where do we put them? And find a place that's um, accessible and convenient for those students. So for example, one of the things that we did is we put together a math for media students table and it fit right into their block schedule. It's right in their building, it's right there. And so media students, a lot of time, you know, they're creative artists and then they meet up with grids and layouts and it, it's a challenge for them. And so to have that math table to help them work on that. 
So we have tutors tutoring every day right now, Monday through Friday. Um, my goal was to make sure that we had a tutor for math, English, computers every day. Um, we're very lucky to also have every day accounting and then the health science prerequisites. So every day a student can come. We have you know a good variety of hours and on different days. That was one of the big complaints we heard from students was, yeah, you told me to go, but the one person I need, they only work on this one day and time and I have class. And so we wanted to have a variety of times and days where students could come and get the help that they need. Um, Let's see, yep, and so some of our goals is to, we do want to increase our hours, we want to increase the, the scope of what we do. We're starting to get requests from the majors. So this week I've been trying to think about how do I find somebody to help with um, cardiovascular physiology. So that's not a gen ed. Um, so starting to, and that's one of the challenges of tutoring is it's, yeah, you can hire more tutors, but it's the trick of figuring out what are the tutors we need for what subjects, and then really figuring out what are the days and times, when would those students be most likely to come? Um, so that's what we're working on this year is thinking about how are we gonna grow? And then really thinking about when and what days, what times do we need to have those tutors on the schedule? The other exciting news that I'll report, and then if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them, is we become a priority for the foundation board at Southeast. Um, they see the need. I think I've heard a lot them talk a lot about industry partners and what they're asking for. So they've been, you know, really dedicated to raising money for us to increase not just our daily operating budget, but also to, um, we wanna do a little bit of redecorating, get some furniture hopefully. And then one of the requests that they've had is that we include an ELL tutor. And so I've been working with Marcella Prokop, who you probably have met, so which I'm very blessed to have um, Marcella and there's one other tutor who we have, who have a, a real background in tutoring. And so Marcella is one of our tutors. She stays late on Wednesday nights and works with students. So she and I, and, and really what we're thinking about is we need that multi-purpose tutor who certainly can do ELL, but then if somebody else walks in, and it's probably gonna be English, right? So, but if you need help with English or speech or one of those things. So, so that's one of the things that we're working on. Um, and that's kind of, that's about it. So if you have questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you. This is your first report. So you did it is awesome. My first report. And it was really scary, I'm sure. So but <laughs> I just think, you know, we had a great report showing our retention recently with what Southeast Tech has as a, um, as a school. So just adding these other layers to help retain those students, help keep them, you know, especially those who have certain factors that make it harder for them in school and we can add these layers to help them, I think is amazing. So I love the ideas you've come up with. So I think those will really just help uh, shore them up yep. for the upcoming year. That's so. our hope, that's our hope. There's one guy on the board who I'm like, you just keep talking, you're making my argument for me. But he <laughs> went on, he said, I hated school, I hated it. He said, I probably never would have gone and I would have dropped out if I had, but I played basketball and I love basketball. But he said, I couldn't get through the gen eds. And he said, I'm old, it was the 70s, there weren't tutoring centers. And so he said, as I think about what we hear from industry partners, they want people with these degrees. And for a lot of them, it's the gen eds mm -hmm. that they give up on. And so that's our hope is to really kind of increase that so that we're reaching out to them and, and saving some of those, increasing that retention. Has there been an, have you seen an increase in student usage this year with the changes or is it still too new? I think new so, still? but it's so, a guess. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. the previous person who did this, when she tracked usage, she wrote down the name of everybody who came once. Mm. And so like I have for all of last year, uh, people's names and that's it. Yeah. And so I, I don't know how many times they came, if they came regularly. What we heard when we were doing our analysis at the beginning of this project was there was a lot of dissatisfaction. Um, I certainly heard it from, so you push and put as an advisor, you're like, you're failing this class, there's tutoring, go to tutoring. And you'd hear things like, they're never there when I need them or they aren't helpful. We heard that from instructors as well who'd say, you know, I send them, but they don't really get the help that they need. 
there wasn't a lot of training mm -hmm. of tutors before. Oh, I should have said that. So one of our strategies was to include faculty tutors. Mm -hmm. So we now have six faculty tutors. I'm hoping that will grow. Um, so they're there and part of what they're tasked with doing is not only meeting with students, but I said, okay, you're in charge of intro to computers. I need you to speak with the intro to computer tutors and tell them what are they should be looking for? How do they help those students? What's the really hurdles assignments that students have in this class? And then thinking about how they can help them. So, so they're there in the day and kind of trying to supervise, especially at the beginning of the semester and start to grow and develop um, the skills of peer tutors. So next year, we will have a much more robust peer tutoring training before they start for the fall. Um, so that's another way we want to really increase. But the faculty tutors have been, that's been wonderful. So yeah, we have a good team. So, and then they're also on our advising council. So we have a working group. And so they're very helpful to say, here's what we're seeing. This is what we need, those kinds of things. How are you um, keeping track then going from when not really having maybe great data yeah. that last year to, to this year? Yes, I've had to accept it's gonna be a little fuzzy this year. And right now it's, we have a paper sign-in sheet because we don't have any much better. Um, so they sign in on paper and then we type it out. And then I created, it's just in like Microsoft Forms and the tutors go in and do a consultation log. We are about to adopt and start regularly using Navigate so yesterday we were on a training and, and that was one of the things I was looking very carefully at is can we use that? And I think it's gonna be great for us because there's ways that students can swipe in. We don't have to worry about the paper sign-up sheets anymore. It'll track them. You can start to analyze. And so like who comes on Tuesdays? Is that the busy day? Or when are we seeing uh, those anatomy physiology students? I was like, these are the busy weeks. That's where maybe we need to have one extra person for that subject. And so once we get, so I've just kind of like, all right, this year we're just gonna make do and do the best we can, and then once we have navigate, I think we'll be um, we'll be able to track much better and more accurately our usage. Yep. Are there any personal uh, connections you're able to make through the professors or you know, and students that maybe are uh, need some extra enrichment? You mean like do professors contact me are right. every Just single day? Awesome. Every day I get <laughs> copied on emails from instructors to students saying, I've copied Julie on this email. Please contact her and discuss with her when the tutoring for whatever subject is there. Um, I had the business department contact me and say, we are through, there was never much for accounting. And accounting is one of our huge, huge needs. And I think especially for business, a, a, a really important area that we need to grow in that they see is the evening and the online students. And so we're, we're talking about and thinking about like, how can we do that right now with what we have? Um, and then where do we wanna go? And so they asked, will you write a blurb? And we can put it in every syllabus and we can really promote it. I'm like, that's fabulous. But we're not ready yet. We <laughs> just have one accounting tutor. So um, yes, I have parents calling me. There was a week I talked to a parent every single day of that week. And now it's sort of tapered off, but probably once a week I get a phone call or an email from a parent who says, my kid is ready to drop out. It's the first year, they're homesick, they wanna come home. I don't want them to. What, <laughs> is there anything you could do to help them? And so, yeah, it's a, instructors, students, I have, yeah, I get a lot of requests. So I think one thing, all of these changes, they've really, um, I'm relatively new, so I don't know what, I've been here a year, so I don't know what it was before, but I feel like just increasing the awareness that I don't think there was nearly as much advertising, promotion, discussion about it. And so doing that, I, I kind of feel like I'm getting a lot of requests from instructors and students. I have students emailing me all the time um, and saying, do you have you know tutors for this? Or the tutor I need, it's on these two days, but that's my class time. Is there anybody I could meet with on this other day? So yeah, that's, it's daily. like. You need to just keep up with the emails um, <laughs> with all the requests, so it's great. Yeah. Thank you. Do I have a motion to acknowledge the a a ARC update? The oh, ARC. <laughs> so moved. Second. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. aye.
um, we, uh, that is approved. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll move on to the next report, Invasive cardio Cardiovascular Cardiac Diagnostic Medical and Vascular son Sonography Programs Overview. And is Kristen, oh, we have Pam first. <laughs> Good afternoon. Well, I'm Pam Boyd. I'm the program director for cardiac um, ultrasound at Southeast Tech. And this show. I'm Joellen Deshawn. I'm the program director for the diagnostic medical sonography program. And on the slide, you see part of the rest of our team for sonography that's not here. Um, Lynn works with me in the DMS program. She's our clinical coordinator. She's been here about a year and a half. And Lexi Willer is the vascular program director and she's been here since August. So we're just gonna talk about our sonography programs. Um, when people wanna know what a medical sonographer is, and I tell my students this, uh, we basically are the ears and the eyes for the interpreting physician. Um, students need to know anatomy, physiology, they need to know pathology, they need to know what tools they need to pull out of the drawer to quantify disease when they, when they see it. They need to know how to optimize the images because there's a lot of trust put in them to you know, make the, all the right measurements, the right call, because the interpreting physician who writes his name on that report may not even see that patient. So some of the duties include, again, optimizing images, the, the Students get to be experts on how to tweak the machine. Every patient's different, which I think makes the job not boring at all. So you need to you know, um, move your patient around, have them do breath hold maneuvers, tweak the machine to get the best possible images for each patient. Um, you also need to be able to recognize and, and recognize disease and some pathologies you may not see once every three or four years. Um, so you need to know, oh boy, that's this or that, I've gotta pull out this measurement or that measurement, tailor my exam um, for that specific pathology. Um, there's also times where you may assist with invasive, semi-invasive procedures in, in my field. Um, that image on the left is a, called a transesophageal echocardiogram where there's a transducer on the end of a, a endoscope Cardiologist puts it down, but you help with the patient with help with sedation, um, getting images and that type of thing. Or you may assist in biopsies that are ultrasound guided, or maybe procedures where fluid is drawn off, that types of things. So students learn about that as, as well. So how does ultrasound work? Um, there's magic crystals in our transducers. They are hit with electricity and they transmit sound into the body in a kind of a planar image. Sometimes it's 20,000 pulses of sound a second, and the machine knows when those pulses were sent, waits for them to come back, analyzes how long it's taken and the intensity of that reflected single signal, and that's what determines where the light, the pixel lights up on the screen. And that happens so fast that it looks like it's, it's real time. This is my area. Um, so if, if you had taken any anatomy at all, you can see that the, the image on the left is a four-chambered heart. Um, the ventricles are at the top and, um, and the atria are at the bottom. The things flipping are the atrioventricular valves. And again, this is a planar type of image, just like MRI or CAT scan. So the image on the right, there's just a little bit of angulation and now you see um, a tube coming off that chamber on the, on the, on the right and that's the aorta. We apply color Doppler, and it's just like the color Doppler you see at the, you know, on the weather station. And that just, with a glance, you can see, well, there's no obstruction to flow, there's no backwards flow, it looks pretty laminar. Um, it, it tells you you're probably not gonna find any surprises when you interrogate that valve a little further. These are a couple of patients that have some trouble. The patient on the left has too much fluid around the heart. So the sonographer would have to recognize, oh, that's a large, pericardial effusion, and sometimes that can get to the point where it just basically chokes off the heart, and it's a condition called cardiac tamponade. So there's hemodynamic um, parameters that are employed when you see this. So the, the, we, the physician counts on the sonographer to say, large effusion may be at the point of tamponade. Um, and so this is when you send up a flare, 
let the um, you know interpreting physician know that you need to read this right away. If it's inpatient, you let the nurse know that you know this patient's you know kind of in in danger. Um, the patient on the right has suffered a myocardial infarction that affected the top of the, the image on the, on the right there. You can see there's a, a mass there in the apex. That's actually thrombus that has accumulated because the, the ventricle's not squeezing well. Blood gets stagnant and a thrombus in, ensues. And there's a little piece of that's kind of mobile. And that's another time to send up a flare that this is a dangerous situation that could embolize and cause a devastating stroke. Um, this looks bad, but this is not so bad. Actually, this is a benign um, tumor in the patient's right atrium. Um, this patient kind of monkeyed around for about a year, you know, felt like their jugular veins were kind of distended. They had some extra pressure in their legs, and they had this benign mass discovered by the, the sonographer um, when, when they finally had an echo ordered. So that's, sometimes we feel like the, kind of like the hero in the, in the situation. We get to help, you know, steer the patient towards the right diagnostic pathway. Um, we also have a vascular sonography program. They look at all the arteries and veins in the body except for the heart. Um, the upper right shows actually um, insonation of the skull. They're looking at blood flow in, in the brain, looking for um, patients that have had a stroke or, or migraines, that type of thing. The image on the left is a patient that had a procedure where they had, um, they went to the cath lab and had some wires and large large wires put in their brachial artery and it didn't seal up after the procedure. So the vascular sonographer was called to see if this patient has what it's called as a pseudoaneurysm and in fact they do. Um, the bottom right image is an image of the carotid arteries. Um, this is a, a large volume procedure in vascular sonography where they look to see if patients um, have atherosclerosis there, um, kind of leading cause of stroke is having disease in those carotid arteries. And this study is another high volume study for vascular sonography, um, looking at the deep veins. And if you can see that little, like a little snake in there, um, that's actually a deep venous thrombosis. So this is another situation that needs to be um, attended to you know, pretty quickly because that could embolize as well and cause like an infarction to the lung or a pulmonary embolism. So, of course, when people say, you know, sonography, the first thing that usually they think of is babies, and that is part of what we train our students to be able to scan in our DMS program. And so, um, as everybody is looking at the cute little babies that are up there, as a sonographer, we're uh, looking at all of the details that might be there. Is Does this baby have a nasal bone, and is it at the correct angle, and are all the... Um, bones in the digits that should be there and sometimes we're measuring them so very much our students need to develop that critical eye that critical thinking piece to really go through there and identify any of the issues that they may have on those scans this is um, also with a baby a fetus and we evaluate the heart as well um, we're looking at something in this age of gestation where we're evaluating all of the chambers of the heart and everything that's functioning there. Um, that heart is about the size of a dime that we're examining and looking through. So of course we have to be very detail oriented in that examination as well. And then the other um, main aspect of the DMS program besides all of the babies is looking at the abdominal and superficial structures that we see. And so we've got some common um, ailments here that we identify. Um, we see the liver and kidney slide there that has actually some fluid between the kidney and the liver, which is indicating that this person has a lot of issues. It's either renal failure or um, liver failure. Those kinds of things are longstanding metastatic cancer that those types of processes develop. The one to the right of that is showing metastatic liver disease in that uh, liver. Sometimes our sonographer is the first one to identify that this patient has something so severe and drastic going on. And so, of course, we're training our students how to identify those and learn how to handle those situations as well. Common problem on the, on the lower left there is gallstones. So that's what they look like if you've had gallbladder issues and have to have your gallbladder out, that's how they can appear. And then we are also involved in things with the renal artery that you see there. Um, if somebody has basically un, uh, 
hypertension that they don't know why, we may be doing that renal artery study to see if there's stenosis that is there. With COVID, um, we've really branched into a lot of pulmonary scanning that we didn't do so much before with ultrasound because it doesn't work well with air, but really developing techniques to understand what's going on with consolidation in lungs. So that's another area that's really kind of um, really blossomed over the last couple of years, whether, whether that's a good thing with COVID or not, uh, we're, we're expanding that technology. So those are all the things that we're really kind of uh, training our students for what the expectation of the profession is, of the level of students that we are graduating from our programs. So the rest of this presentation is more about what we've got going on at Southeast Tech. Um, we've got some images of our lab there and you may have, I think some of you have been out touring at that too and seeing some of that. So we do have a lot of imaging equipment and it is you know, very consistent with what's currently in hospitals and healthcare facilities. We have a variety of equipment, a lot of different brands so the students can learn and get familiar with um, different companies and how the different machines work. We also have a digital archiving system in our lab, which is cloud-based, so students can see what they've been scanning, we can see what they've been scanning, and we can access that anywhere we can access internet. Part of our program, the last part of it, is a seven-month clinical internship, and our students will go multiple, or I shouldn't say multiple, but a variety of different places across the country where their internships are uh, located, we um, are kind of in this corridor, you know, most, but we also spread out to the very tip of Texas, um, out to the East Coast at times in Virginia. Um, we've gone, had clinical sites up in Alaska as well, so our students kind of get everywhere across the country. We are also preparing our students for national credentialing exams, and we are uh, using the American Registry of Diagnostic Medical Sonographers. Our students actually have to take at least two board exams or two parts to that exam. The first part is an ultrasound physics exam, and so that's why we rely, uh, put a lot of weight into physics and um, really learning how that sound beam interacts with the tissues. And so they take that first board basically after their first year in the program and then at the end of the program, they're going to take their uh, specialty credentialing exams. Those in the DMS program actually take two, so they become credentialed in the abdominal sonography and also in obstetric sonography. The um, cardiac students take the adult echo board and then the vascular students take the vascular technology board. Once a student is, or a person is registered, it's a little bit easier then to add on. So there's multiple different um, things that we can add on with that. Our programs are all accredited by the KHAP, or the Commission on Accreditation of Allied Health Education Programs. So cardiac and vascular programs have been at Southeast Tech since 1990 and accredited since 1995, and are currently working under a 10-year accreditation, which happened in 2016. Our DMS program started in 20, or 2002, I should say, um, and it's been accredited since 2006, and we have, were just recently awarded a 10-year accreditation back in March. So all of our sonography programs are associate degree programs, and they all have some prerequisite courses that you know Julie was working on to make sure that they pass. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that, depending on the program, that's anywhere from 16 to 20 credits. And then we've got in the program, in those two years after the prereqs, we've got anywhere from 72 to 75 credits. Because as you can see, we have a lot of things that the students need to learn in a short amount of time. Um, we have done some, a little bit of research on ONET. Um, on this one here is from South Dakota, looking at the um, perspective of how many should be employed coming up. And so the growth in South Dakota is looking pretty good over the next few years here. And of course, that's going to vary somewhat um, year to year and region to region of where that need is, but we see that as a favorable trend. 
Um, when we look at the Bureau of Labor Statistics, they also have a positive outlook. I believe it's at 12% for this 10-year period of growth that we're looking at. But when we also look at it, we've got good salaries that um, they report. So right now, the average annual salary is around close to 78,000. Of course, that's average of everybody everywhere um, in, in all those modalities. So looking at some of the specific statistics from our programs in cardiac, this is just reviewing the last three years. And um, we've, we've always done well with job placement, nearly 100% almost every year. That little asterisk is there because I think that year the one student kind of um, dallied around and didn't get one well, until after the, go back to school yeah. and you said no life would be too good as a sonographer so then you go yeah to so he came back to it um, but otherwise and our um, credentialing pass rates have been you know at 100 percent quite often in the last three years for sure and then you can see the average salary of our graduates on there this last year we've got 30 plus dollars an hour for cardiac and then um, on this next slide here too, um, with the DMS program, you can see where we're sitting with the retention rates, so the last three years in job placement rates, as well as um, board placement or board uh, pass rates. Had a little issue um, last year and this year, and personally I'm chalking that up to COVID and the changes that we had to go through with online and in person, but still doing um, very well as you know, way above the national pass rate. And then the vascular program, um, same thing as far as job placement and credentialing rates. And uh, I guess we passed by the previous salary, but again, you know, at least $26 an hour or better on average here with vascular, and then the DMS was a little bit more than that. So if you have any questions about sonography before we turn it over for the invasive portion. No, this is great information, and congrats on your success of your programs to all of you. Thank you very much for your work. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Jenna Bush. I am the program director for Invasive Cardiology. Invasive Cardiology is kind of the forgotten uh, program. A lot of the public doesn't even know what Invasive Cardiology um, is unless they hear it on Grey's Anatomy where somebody's having an MI and they yell out, call in the cath lab, okay? <laughs> Most of our students that come um, to school and they um, do tours, they're not even sure what invasive cardiology is until we give them the tour. Most of them, most students think RN, they think respiratory therapy, they think I wanna work in the OR, I wanna be a surge tech, and then they come and they are able to tour our facility. So as, like I said, a lot of these students start talking about all these different um, professions in the, cat, or in the health field, and then we start talking about different classes and different topics that we cover in invasive cardiology. Um, one of them would be radiation physics. So just like in radiology, they take still pictures. In the cath lab, we take what they call fluoro or cine, which is able to follow contrast through the vessels. So instead of just taking one picture, we take like a video. Um, we go very, very in depth in cardiac anatomy and physiology, as well as we start to learn all of the modalities of angiography and hemodynamics, the pressures within the chambers of the heart and how to diagnose di diseases and things like that. And then we have the ever-growing um, structural heart, um, which it just, within the last 10 years has blown up between LV assist devices and electrophysiology um, and being able to put new valves in without having to open up the chest. So, well, I guess it doesn't wanna play. This is one of our catheters, the yellow, um, Looks like a stick with a balloon on it. It's called the swan Gantz catheter. We are able to go up into the heart and measure the different chambers of the heart, as well as kind of measure the cardiac output, the amount of blood that the heart's being pumped out, and be able to kind of look at the lungs in a different way. That's called a right heart cath.
So this is coronary angiography. Um, coronary angiography is the vessels that go around the heart. Like I said, um, when somebody's having an MI, there is a blockage in there. And within the cath lab, we are able to go in with our stents and balloons and fix it. Most of these um, patients that come in used to be, they used to have to come over and they'll get fixed and then they'd be at the hospital for two, three days for recovery or they'd have to go to bypass. Now they come to us and they're going home by the next day. So just like any other vessel, if you're able to fix around the heart, we're able to fix all the vessels. Those are your peripheral vessels. Um, this is an angiogram right here of a left common femoral. Um, we are able to fix the legs and put stents in as well as the renals and subclavians. Anywhere there's a blockage in a vessel, the plumbing side of the cath lab can fix it. So the structural heart um, has, like I said, blown up. A lot of people have been hearing a lot of ECMO in the nose because of COVID. ECMO is an LV assist device. So is what it does is the LV is what pumps the blood all to the heart or from the heart to the body. And ECMO is able to transport the blood and give that left ventricle a rest. Um, within the cath lab, we are able to place all the different tubes and vessels that we need to and hook them up to the machines like this. Um, we are also able to, like I said, put in valves without opening up the chest. We're now able to go in through the wrist or through the femoral artery and go up and place new valves as well as mitral clips. A lot of valve diseases are being cured now within two, three days and not having the post infections and the recovery time that they used to. So our students and I are very, very thankful. Over the last year, we have four, well, a couple, two new updated and uh, two brand new simulators. Um, within our lab, we are now able to do full um, diagnostic and interventional procedures. So we are able to perform, the students are able to um, cannulate just like they would um, vessels with catheters and they are able to have their own angiography and cine, as you can see on that big screen on the picture on the right. We are able to inject contrast and perform full procedures, including the TAVR um, procedures. So when my students are able and going out to the clinical setting, um, they've already done it. On the left-hand side, we have Oscar, is his name, and he is our full full-fledged 250 pound mannequin that is able to breathe he's able you're able to draw blood from him he maintains as a body he runs off of carbon dioxide oxygen and nitric um, we are able to palpate all of his pulses he has a full set of vitals and that would be the screen on the left on the screen on the right is a physiological monitor within the invasive um, profession, you don't just scrub all day long. Um, we are able to circulate, because once you're scrubbed in, we are sterile. So you circulate and get everything that the doctor or the scrub may need, or you are able to monitor. And that where, where all the hemodynamics comes in and taking all of the diagnostic testing and putting it into uh, a transcription for the doctor. And that is what that physiological monitor does. It's able for us to create transcription for the doctor. Our students, further on in the picture, um, one of the main things that we do over the summer classes is I teach ACLS, Advanced Life Support. Once you pass your boards as a registered invasive cardio specialist, you are able to run your own codes. So students are able to give Oscar drugs and see what happens and how all the different algorithms are performed as well as they are able to learn how to use a defibrillator, a real one, um, just like that they have at the hospital if they need to shock Oscar. So over the last three years, our student enrollment kind of looks a little low. Um, our student completion, same with COVID and just everything that has happened, um, but the best is yet to come. 
We have revamped Invasive more in the last year with our new um, simulators and just a whole different look and of updating. Build Dakota is also one of our huge scholarships within Invasive, um, which is even growing as we speak. Uh, Rapid City has also signed on and sponsored a student. Before then, we've only had hospitals within Sioux Falls. So we have, I would say, a little under half of my students are on Build Dakota Scholarship and are sponsored either by Sanford, Vera, or Memorial. Um, out in Rapid City. The bar graph on the right is um, the difference in pay between a CBT, which is someone who has not passed their boards, just a cardiovascular technician, and RCES. Once you pass your boards, you are able to say if you don't necessarily care for RCIS, which is everything I just explained, you can go ahead and you can go into the electrophysiology side, which we also have classes um, for, so they kind of have an idea of what they're getting themselves into. RCES is more on the pacemaker side, putting in pacemakers, doing ablations, fixing arrhythmias, um, and then your RN and then your RT. A lot of this, um, well, this bar graph is from just the Midwest. It was produced by the CCI, which is our cardiovascular, cardiovascular prevention and um, agency. So we're running right at like I think $37, $37 an hour um, starting out here in the Midwest. And then um, as travelers, a lot of my students think it's beyond amazing that you can work for a year and then go on and take assignments and make double that and travel. Thank you. How many uh, students do you have in the program this fall then? I have 12. Awesome. So yes. you know, growing it. And, so yes. and what would be full, like what could be full for you guys on that? 22. 22. Awesome. We're getting there. Oh, you're <laughs> after, yeah, I, I like the, the trajectory. We're good. <laughs> We're trying up. Um, I think the biggest thing right now is just getting the word out there. Like I said, a lot of students don't know what invasive cardiology is until um, they either come to the school and do a tour or somebody they know has been to the cath lab. Do you do any work with um, like the Avera Academy and uh, do you go in and talk to those students at all? We do, we do the scrubs camp and then also with CTE, um, numerous tours and awesome. stuff like that. Yeah, I would think, you know, there's high school students who are really good at math and science, but maybe just don't want to um, commit to a four year or whatever and when they, if they could see you know, how they could use those skills and that knowledge um, and really in a shorter amount of time um, and get some really good hands-on experience. I think that would be very appealing to them. So I'm glad to hear that you're kind of in their faces about that too. <laughs> Working on it. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, seeing no more questions, do I have a motion to approve or acknowledge, I should say, excuse me, the... Stay out of there. Yeah, <laughs> um, all of the reports we had on invasive cardiovascular, cardiac diagnostic, medical, vascular sonography overview. So moved. Second. I have motion and second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Thank you all. Well, good afternoon, President Mickelson, members of the board. Uh, my name is Benjamin Valdez, Vice President for Academic Affairs. I want to take a moment to bring you up to speed and inform you of an upcoming visit from the Higher Learning Commission. We will be hosting a visiting team uh, here in a, a week and a half on October 18th and 20th so that we will be able to add here on community campus and Sanford Stevens Center as additional locations to Southeast Tech. So going through that process, um, one thing I did want to make sure that the board understood is that HLC has two definitions regarding um, off-campus sites. Uh, one is an additional location. Additional location is defined as a site where 50% or more of a program is uh, being completed and there is no administrator, there is no additional support. A lot of those supports, a lot of the components are delivered remote from the main campus. 
Uh, a branch campus, on the other hand, is an actual campus set up, and we would have to have an administrator on site. We would have to have uh, admissions, uh, financial aid, student success, all of those ancillary services we brought at main campus would have to be provided at a branch campus. So our applications to HLC are for an additional location. And we, we are all set up to provide those at those two locations. Our visiting team, on a traditional visiting team, uh, HLC typically has two individuals and they're typically from out of state. Because of COVID and HLC getting back on track, they have for the last year and a half uh, try to find individuals from your own home state, and they've also uh, limited the number of people that are coming. In this case, our visiting uh, team member from HLC is going to be Dr. Jeanette McGreevy. She is the current uh, Director of Institutional Effectiveness and Assessment and Policy at Dakota State University. So we're gonna be very excited to form an additional partnership and be able to welcome her on campus and have her see what we're doing on the inside uh, we're really hoping that that really o o enlightens uh, a lot of members of the border regions in Dakota State regarding the great things going on at Southeast Tech and what we are doing. Um, the schedule on Monday when she shows up, we're going to start off with a brief meeting with the senior leadership. She'll be going over kind of her process and what she'll be looking for. And then as you can see, she kind of goes through different areas that she'll be meeting individually with groups or individuals. Uh, Rich gets to be the first lucky person on her uh, schedule, so she'll be meeting, talking about the financial components. Uh, a lot of that is just to trying to understand and make sure that the sites are financially supported, that we are able to have the equipment, supplies, faculty, everything needed to make sure that the program is successful. Uh, we go through the process, what should we be with student success, admissions, financial aid, how are we supporting the students, how are we ensuring that what we provide to students here at main campus, those students are being uh, have access to that and that we're making sure that they're going to be successful. Uh, she'll also be meeting with other information technology group because a lot of what we're doing, especially in Huron, will be remote delivery of some of our programs, some of our services. How's that working? How's that going with all the equipment, all the infusion of technology that we're adding on campus? Uh, at the end of the day on Monday, she'll actually be going out to the Stevens Center. She'll be doing a tour. She'll be meeting with the program director out there, talking about the program. She'll also meet with students within the paramedic science program, since that's the program that's housed at the Stevens Center. Uh, she'll also be with faculty. Our gen ed faculty will join the paramedic faculty, and she'll be able to inter interact with faculty direct, talk about the program, talk about how we're doing. On Wednesday, then, she'll be meeting uh, Kristen uh, Paseo and Jackie Kramer, uh, the dean and associate dean for health and nursing out at the Huron Community Campus. Uh, day, again, start off very similar, brief overview and introduction with administration. Then she will meet with the faculty out there. The programs, again, that we have in Huron are our LPN, our RN, and we've now started our medical assisting program out there. So those will be the three programs she'll be looking at. A uh, little more in depth uh, view there because we actually will have a lab, we have actual labs out there. So she'll be kind of walking through and seeing the equipment, support services we have there, and we have faculty uh, that live there. So she'll be talking with them a little different. Uh, she'll then meet with students. And uh, oh, during the faculty component, our uh, nursing and LPN faculty will remote in, so she can kind of see how that remote component works when students remote with us. Uh, at the end of the day, she will do a debrief with the senior administration uh, from Southeast Tech. Uh, the one thing I need to point out, when she does her debrief, she will not be providing us with a recommendation. HLC removed that and does not allow a visiting team to let you know what they're going to recommend. Uh, she'll simply talk about the good things and opportunities for improvement that she saw during her visit. Uh, about 30 days later, we will receive her report. The report that we receive from her is an opportunity to review for errors and omissions. We are not allowed to submit additional evidence or change the report at all unless there is an error or, or omission from that report. Then at that point, we can make those, those corrections. Uh, once we sign off on that, on her initial report to us, she then submits it to the Higher Learning Commission and it goes through their review process. Their review process starts first with the HLC staff. They will review her report. They will review all documents we have submitted, the questions that have been asked by 
the uh, initial, si uh, initial team uh, earlier this year, and they will then prepare a report and a recommendation to the board of directors for the Higher Learning Commission. Uh, once they're done, they will then submit it to what's known as the Institutional Actions Committee, the IAC. That is another peer review group, group that will go through everything that the HLC staff has done and uh, Dr. McGreevy or the visiting team, and they will then prepare a recommendation to the HLC board. The HLC uh, board of directors will then take everything and they will act on it upon at their next scheduled meeting, which if everything goes on, line, on track would be in uh, December. So we're hopefully by December or January, depending on how they're kind of doing their meetings this year, we'll know if we get that final approval uh, for those two as additional locations. Uh, so it's kind of the process. We're excited about this process because with us having a full-blown site visit in 2023 from the commission, this really starts to get us in that mode of what HLC is going to be coming and doing. And, uh, and the nice part, single person, it's a small visit. So we'll, we'll kind of get our feet wet, get everybody on campus accustomed to these visits, these uh, interactions with Higher Learning Commission and prepare us for that uh, major visit that we'll have in 2023 in, in April of 2023. Send open for questions. Well, good luck, and I know you have also the upcoming uh, school-wide meetings uh, as well as the preparation. Yes, we've been doing a lot of training. We started our first training to prepare for this visit last Friday. We'll be doing some faculty trainings over the next week or so, just to make sure everyone's up to speed and comfortable with this. And I think we're we're really on track and really excited about that. This is going to be very successful for us. Is this? Are you the first school, technical school in South Dakota that's? I believe we'll be the first one to have additional locations uh, here in South Dakota, the technical colleges. Good luck. Sounds great. Yes, we're excited. I think it'll be really nice, assuming everything goes well and it's approved, to be able to have, you know, additional named sites um, for, I mean, Huron has been a great, um, for the community, uh, they really need the health care services and the training and stuff right in their community, and so it'll be nice to have something maybe a little bit more official um, to really, you know, for advertising and for growth and all of those things. So, um, yeah, it seems like you guys are well prepared and, and excited maybe for it to happen and be done. And then here in November or no, December, get the results back. So, Thank you. Do I have a motion to acknowledge the HLC additional Hello. location? Do I have a second? Second. Um, I have a motion and a second. All those, in, I'm just taking it back. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, I Good job, Mark. I just keep it in. going. <laughs> um, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Those are approved. Anything aye. else? Seeing none, do I have a motion for adjournment? So moved. Second. And motion second. All those in favor of adjournment, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, we are adjourned.